My name is David D. Shindley, Shindley. Captain, U.S. Air Force, retired. In 1966, I was involved in an incident while stationed at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. I was told to never speak of the incident again, and also told that as far as I was concerned, it never happened. Because of that, I am before you today with a bit of trepidation. I must say a, a lot of trepidation. As I have never before shown my face in person on this matter. I was a Minuteman ICBM launch control officer, a first lieutenant, and a deputy missile combat crew commander in a two-man launch control uh, launch crew with my crew commander who held the rank of captain. He was about 15 years older than I. Uh, you can show that first slide, please, if you can. I held a top secret clearance, which was required for my job. It all began one morning when I was watching TV while having breakfast, and I heard the local news announcer mention that some residents in the town of Mulhall, North Dakota, had seen strange lights overnight which they attributed to a UFO. This caught my attention because I was scheduled for duty that morning at a launch control facility called November Flight, about three miles west of Mulhall and about 37 miles north of Minot, North Dakota. I lived in the town of Minot at the time and I drove to the air base to attend the morning pre-departure crew briefing at Wing headquarters where all 15 missile crews would normally meet each day prior to pulling alert duty at their respective launch control facilities. During that uh, pre-departure crew briefing, it was mentioned that some missiles at November flight had gone off alert, but there was no in further information provided. I immediately connected this to the news item that I heard earlier in the morning regarding a possible UFO sighting near the town of Mohawk. When the briefing was over, several, launch, several of the launch crews seated near, near me commented about the news item, which they had also heard that morning. And there was speculation about a possible connection with November flight. My crew commander had also heard the news item. And we were both anxious and quite curious about what we might find as we drove out to the launch control facility. If you could display my second slide. On this second slide, uh, I don't believe you members have a picture of this, but you can see it on the screen here. This is the November Launch Control Facility from an air view from Google Earth. If you could show that again. There is an access road to the flight uh, to the facility from the north coming down to the flight facility where there's a main gate at the perimeter fence. The perimeter fence goes around the launch conf control facility building top side and there's a, a, a garage to the right of the uh, main gate. The usual procedure upon arrival was to inspect the grounds and building but this time my commander immediately went into the security section of the building to debrief security personnel and guards. This was, the security center was the topmost north side of the building near the main gate. I entered the facility from the back door at the end of the facility and then encountered the site manager, a tech sergeant, who immediately took me into the day room and asked if I had been briefed on the previous night's events. I said I hadn't. We then proceeded toward the windows on the west side of the day room where he described to me the large object with flashing lights that, been, that had been hovering just outside the fence that night. And he spread his arms out in front of him to indicate its size, the size of the object. Based on his description, I estimated the object may have been 80 to 100 feet wide and approximately 100 feet from the building, maybe a bit closer. 
I immediately asked if it had been a helicopter. And he said that it just hovered with no noise being heard, quite unlike the usual noisy helicopters heard from within the building. I also asked what the flashing lights were like, but he could not answer. They were unlike any had, he had ever seen. They were not like the usual beacon lights on planes, but something like a pulsating glow. He then said the object, while hovering close to the ground, then glided to the right toward the north end of the building and out of sight. The object then came into view from the security section of the facility and hovered just behind and slightly to the right of the main gate concealed partly by the large garage located within the fenced area to the right of the gate. And as, as you can see there, the garage is labeled the second position of the object. This, this location put the object almost directly above the hardened launch control capsule located 60 feet below ground. All our missiles, our 10 missiles, were located 4 to 14 miles away from the launch control facility. This capsule was located approximately underneath the garage. This was the launch crew quarters and the launch control center for all 10 interconnected nuclear tip missiles that were located away from the launch facility. Security personnel confirmed everything that's th that the site manager, manager had related to me. My commander and I then proceeded to take the elevator down to the launch control center, the capsule, to relieve the two-man officer crew below. After enter entering the capsule, our eyes were immediately transfixed on the launch control console, which showed that all missiles were off alert and unlaunchable. We had never seen such a thing before. The outgoing crew briefed us on the wild events that transpired overnight and indicated that the missiles malfunctioned at the time the object was hovering directly above the capsule and next to the main gate. <laughs> We speculated on the possibility of an EMF pulse that might have created the situation. We had no doubt, however, that the 10 outline nuclear tip missiles of November flight had been compromised, tampered with, and put out of commission by the object that had paid a visit. Normally, it was quite unusual to have even one missile down, except for maintenance. And Wing Headquarters was, was very proud of having more than 95% uptime for all 150 missiles of the wing. The following morning, after we had been relieved by the follow-on crew, we arrived topside, and I attempted to further query the flight security controller who had been on duty at the time of the situation. But he interrupted me, and he said that he had been instructed not to discuss the incident. That is when my commander then told me that he had received a call while I was on a scheduled rest break down below. And he told me, and he was told that we were never to discuss the incident. When I asked where the directive came from, he said the OSI. He evidently received a call from the OSI. With no discussion allowed on the subject between him and or me together or with anybody else, uh, my crew commander and I were left in limbo and left on our own to conjure in our own minds how other simulation situations might unfold and be, ha be handled. Normally, the Air Force would train us on all procedures. We were in a simulator constantly training. This serious lack of follow through by the Air Force was more than bewildering, and it served to keep this situation on our minds. Together, there were, were a dozen of us involved with this incident. My commander and I were not there during the encounter, but we had to deal with the ramifications of the incident, and I'll never forget the frightened emotion on the faces of topside airmen who were gathered with me when I was briefed by the site manager. Because those of us at the launch control facility, besides those of us at the launch control facility, there had to be many more people involved with this, including maintenance people who had to retarget and reline the missiles, also additional security personnel to guard and protect the missile launch facilities, and who knows how many others on base. 
uh, were concerned. Everyone had been silenced. The incident was never discussed, and I never heard a word of any other incident from people that I associated with. I never spoke a word about my incident, incident for almost 40 years, and my wife never knew. After several years of searching the internet in hopes of finding someone who would give me a clue about my incident. Excuse me, Mr. Shane. Yes. We, uh, I, I yield you an additional ten minutes. Two minutes, excuse me. Okay, thank you. thank you. I then found what was described by Captain Robert Salas, and I felt immediate joyous freedom from my haunting memory. I then informed my wife. Since then, I have run across several missileers from my days at Minot who were there with me in the wing, and two of them have gone public with their own experiences. Two others have described to me their unique experiences, but they have pleaded that I not divulge their names. They fear losing their Air Force pension, are losing their personal integrity and keeping a secret, or being ridiculed. I also know of two other officers involved in, in, in incidents, but they will not admit to their, to their secret, probably for the same reasons. And then there's the late Captain Val Smith of my squadron, who has mentioned in official documents released by a FIA. He was interviewed by the late Dr. Alan Hynek a Blue Book fame, who wrote an article in the Saturday Evening Post published on 17 December 1966, which was des described, which described the incident that Smith was involved with on 25th August 1966. Hynek stated in the article, this incident was not picked up by the press. It's typical of the puzzling cases that I've studied during the 18 years that I've served as the Air Force's scientific consultant on the problem of UFOs. Display the third slide, please. Just prior to release of this post article, the Minot Daily News got wind of it and then published on 6 December 1966 a front page news item with major bold headline that read, Minot Launch Control Center Saucer, cited as one indication of outer space visitors. The front page. I remember this article. I thought, oh. Maybe I can start talking. In 1966, when I was at Minot, the evidence was everywhere that something quite unique was happening. But I was embedded in a shell of silence. The Air Force knew the truth. The Air Force knew that I knew the truth. And that is the only reason they warned and instructed me that it never happened. 